So who's my guest this week? The last Afghan women's minister has seen a sapphic. Afghanistan, the 1970s, an era of hope for women. As the 80s started, my guests turned five and everything changed. Over time, freedoms and education were rolled back. Violence and humiliation commonplace. She and her family escaped. And as the years passed, she dedicated herself in exile to campaigning for women's rights. As democracy returned to Afghanistan, so did she, eventually appointed to run the Ministry of Women's Affairs under the last Afghan government, only to have to escape again last August as the Taliban regained power. Ever since, she's been living with her family as a refugee in a London hotel. This interview is going to give you a remarkably powerful account of what it was like to flee the Taliban. Here's what's coming up. I had nothing to flee. I was not even concerned about what will happen to me. I was so concerned with the big, big, big group of people that I was seeing there. What have we done that we are facing this time? So it's, it's very different. I really forgot that I'm living. When I was eating, I was crying because I thought that I'm eating, but there are many people who are not eating there. Why should I eat? Why should I live? I couldn't help any woman back then. Hasina, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the programme. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I wanted to start by saying, do you worry that the world has forgotten a bit about Afghanistan at the moment? Uh, what I see today is uh, there is a very total uncertainty uh, globally about what to do. Whereas the world has forgotten that there was a 20 years of investment on the human resources of Afghanistan. So there is always a hope and an approach to move forward. They have forgotten, but there are many opportunities if they just dig out about or within their surroundings. How are the people that you're talking to, who, as you say, left alone under the Taliban? Uh, I think basically uh, there is still a lot of fear. There is a lot of uh, uncertainty. There is a lot of... Uh, mm, hopelessness because, uh, and also insecurity. Uh, so the people really do not know because almost every week there is a new news. Mm. Uh, and instead of the situation getting better uh, or the situation becoming hopeful, it's becoming deteriorated. Uh, starting from the day one, uh, where stopping women uh, for going to offices uh, abolishment of women ministry, the same thing, stopping of women organizations uh, and asking the women who were in leadership positions, those who were still in Afghanistan to stay back home uh, and many other things. So day by day, there is not a concrete or tangible uh, indicator or directive through which you can see that there is a space or a place for the women of Afghanistan or for their future. But it, but it also, if I may say, with, with these reports of girls getting ready to go back into school, so excited, really looking forward to being able to go back in. The boys have been let back in, yes. the girls have not. But on the actual day they were expected to go in, yes. there is a U-turn, they, they don't let them in. Everyone is shocked. Why? Is it a sin to be a girl in such, such or in, in a certain location? No, it's not. So what is it? It's a country, it's a structure. There are many, many big things to think about. Why is a women's scarf, a women's dress, a women's school, why is this an agenda? There are many national priorities to move forward for nation building, for the development of the country. Why is this the first priority? 
at this critical situation. And why do you think it is, knowing what you know of the Taliban, having lived through the time that you've been in? I think there is no clear vision. There is no clear structure. There is no governance policy. There has been a big investment on the education of women, generally education, and then specifically on women and girls in the last 20 years. So for me, not only the present de facto government, but also the international community shall be accountable because they have invest invested so much in education and health. Why are they just becoming only the people who are listening? Why there is no intervention? Where is the mutual accountability? Why are we not talking? We are all related to each other mm -hmm. as the basis of humanity, as the basis of investment in the last 20 years. Do you think that women will get an education, that women will be allowed back into their jobs? What are your levels of hope like at the moment? Uh, well, presently from the situation that I see about the present structure in Afghanistan, I'm totally hopeless. Because day after day, what the, you, you hear things that you can't even imagine. Why would the girls not go to school? even if there is no resources. Where are the commitments? Why, for example, we heard that the teachers and the doctors are getting their pay. So why are they getting the pay if the children are not going to school? So there should be a very clear definition, a very clear structure of what they want to do. So that is why it is really hopeless in present situation in Afghanistan. But on the whole, the world is there to help each other. This is the time for the world to think about the people of Afghanistan, to think about the women of Afghanistan. And to take your mind back, if I may, to what happened in August. I mean, much has been made about how chaotic the evacuation was. I think there was not a proper plan. There was not a proper plan for the way it was proceeded. The decision was taken, plans could be done, uh, plans could be made, discussions could be made on an ad hoc urgent basis, but they did not happen. That is why today still there are many, many people who need to be evacuated, they are stuck, they are back in Afghanistan, whose lives are real in danger. Because they that helped is, the West and now they're on a list with the Taliban? Because or? because they helped the West, but they helped the humanity. Yes. They wanted to live generally. But I mean, that's like, how they would be viewed by the Taliban, potentially. That's why you say exactly. they would be in danger. Uh, exactly. So they are still stuck in Afghanistan. That is why whenever I'm talking, I'm basically suggesting for the world on three basic or fundamental issues. The first one is urgent action on humanitarian and protection of those people who really invested their lives for work, for the success of the international donation or help or support. The second thing is the midterm solution for me as a woman. The caretaker has no vision for women as a woman and we can never ignore women, especially in a country like Afghanistan where the majority of population are, are women. And the third thing is the definition of the international relation with Afghanistan. The international community should really sit together and based on their priorities, they have to match up the present situation of Afghanistan for a reason which is help and support the humanity, the people and the women of Afghanistan. Beyond financial aid you're exactly. talking about because of course the that has been the way that Afghanistan has just about avoided famine because of the levels of donation, food, aid on that front. But you're talking about actually intervening. Exactly. How did you actually escape? Uh, Ema, to be honest, I was not planning to leave. Really? Uh, yes. My plan was that I cannot leave because there are so many women who need me here. But after that, I saw that the situation was deteriorating. And some of my close friends suggested that your life is valuable for us. I had worked a lot with the, 
British uh, organizations and foreign ministry. Um, and I really don't know how I wrote the email. Uh, I did not know who to contact, but I wrote the email and the contacts which I had. And then I think after uh, two days um, uh, and definitely coordination of uh, the international sisters who had made a, uh, an informal group to save the lives of women, mm -hmm. especially the women who were in decision-making positions. Uh, they were in contact, contact. They were telling me, you will get an email, you will get an email. And almost every second they would say, did you get an email? Did you get an email? And then after, when I received the email from them, uh, that you have to come to Baron Hotel uh, in 12 hours. Um, I did not know where Baron Hotel was. That's in Afghanistan. Uh, no? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, I did not have any vehicles, so I messaged uh, them back, not the email address, but the group of women yeah. who were helping me. I told them I have no vehicles, nothing to go. So can you arrange for the vehicles? They told me we will try. So they arranged once and then I think there were some security issues, they canceled it. Because like I never was assuming this situation, so that is why, and I was a role model to many people because I also believe in a balanced life. So I, I was a lot in public. Everyone knew me, shopkeepers, everyone knew me. That is why there was a lot of security issues on those days. One of the other female uh, minister, former minister, she called me and she gave me the number who had helped her. Uh, so, uh, and they were uh, demanding for some uh, financial uh, like rent. So I got my son's piggy bank where we were all the time in his birthday, we were giving him and we broke that and we had some money which we could give the uh, logistic company or the people who... We did not go through the formal airport because it was too crowded. Someone told us that you can go from behind. The drivers, they guided us. We went there, uh, the family was with me. Um, they told me to go in, but when I went there, it was a terrible situation. There was a lot of fire guns, there was a lot of lashing, they were lashing people. Some of the family got lashes. The, and when, the Taliban yes, were doing this? Yes, yes. So, and some of your, fa some of your family yeah. Three of lashes. the family members received lashes. And then I decided that no way, because they were also gun firing. And I said, if something happens to them and I'm alive, I will never uh, live with that guilt. So we decided, me and my husband, that we will go back home, whatever happened on the way. I was on half of the way when my friend, uh, the former minister, she called me and she, she scolded me, in fact. She said, don't do this mistake. You have to come. There is a, a very, um, a canal where the suicide attack happened two days after. So she said, we also came from that way. I said, I cannot go because my family is with me and I had an elderly sick mother. She said, no, whatever you do, if you go back, you, I know you will not be alive. And then when I went there, there was a big crowd going up, going down, going up. I think maybe 1,000 or 800 people were there. Um, so we came up. Finally, we came and I called uh, a number. I don't know, it's maybe destiny or God helped us. The number went through and it was one of my uh, female friends who were organizing this and I call her and I said, I don't know what to do. I'm in here in the crowd. I'm on the top of that dirty ditch with the family, what to do? So you're standing with, with all of your family. There's a lot of people a around. Almost, I'm just trying to picture this. Yes, and yes. You're, at, you're at the top of a ditch, you said. Yes, yes. There and is a, you're, yes. you're ringing yes. someone to try and yes. find out how you yes. can leave Afghanistan, yes. how yes. you can escape. Yes. How are you feeling at this time that you've got elderly family with you, you've got your children? And That's you've... why um, I told you that I really did not understand that 
what was all the struggle that I did in the last 20 years. It was the second time that I had to leave my country. I left my country when I was five years old, when Russian invaded Afghanistan. And with, from fi five years old till 25, I struggled with each drop of my blood to go back, invest my, my, my knowledge, invest my talent for my coming generations so that they do not feel. And I really was killed on that night, Emma. I had nothing to feel. I had no feelings. My only concern, I was not even concerned about what will happen to me. I was so concerned with the big, big, big group of people that I was seeing there. People were sitting with their papers, passports, everything, and they were saying, oh, I have worked with this, oh, I have. And I was like, how helpless we are. Who have, what have we done that we are facing this, 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 this time? So that is why it was, it was really like, to be very honest, I could not feel anything till one month. I was all the time crying. In the middle of the night, I was sweating, I was waking up, and I was thinking someone is knocking the door or there is something happening outside. There are some, some of their own voices or whatever they were doing. So it's, it's very different, very different. I cannot, I really forgot the time living. When I was eating, I was crying because I thought that I'm eating, but there are many people who are not eating there. Why should I eat? Why should I live? I couldn't help any woman back there. I'm so sorry. Still, it's like that. It's difficult. It's very difficult. I think even just that moment that you described where you have to be with your family and you've got to think about them and being safe, but you have such a a duty to your people and to your country. Even then, I tried to help, but I was helpless. I couldn't help myself. I couldn't help anyone. So it's, it's, it's very difficult. And then after that, the soldier told us, you are, you are safe now. And then they took us inside the airport because no one because we left that place, so he did not know where to take us. So I showed the paper, and then he took us to the, that ground where the planes were departing. They were sitting and departing. I think maybe for three or five hours we were there. There were the big space planes they were leaving. All of a sudden, I saw that there was, it was written Royal Space. And I told the soldier that, can you show this uh, paper to that commander? He said, I'm not allowed to. I said, okay, if you're not allowed, I will stay here, no problem. I have been constantly asking him about how long should we stay? He said, we don't know. And then I think it was around one o'clock at 1 a.m. and that uh, the soldier went, but he came back. He said, I will take the paper. So he took the paper to the UK uh, soldier, commander, I think. Then he took the paper, he read that, and he took that to inside the plane. Maybe there were some other. And then they waved to us. And after that, we came we entered the bus and they said that you are in safe hands now. And we were all crying him on that time. That we been. even didn't know how to hug each other. So it was a difficult time. And then after that, we came to the UK base. And from that onwards, I think, as a human being, I have to recognize that that it was all care and humanity for everyone. There was no special, there was no 
prioritization, but they were just treating everyone. I know how hard and difficult it must be for them. They have been in constant work as and a person. You're still with your family, as yes. I understand it, in a hotel yes. in the UK. Yes. And it's about seven months or so now that you will have been in yes. this accommodation. Mm -hmm. How has that been? I, you know, we're thinking a lot about how many people are displaced at the moment yes. around the world. Yes. This is the second time that you've done this, but yeah. how has it been for your family and you living in the hotel? Actually, to be very honest, Emma, uh, they, are, they were very concerned about my life. So none of them have been telling me anything. But from what I see, uh, they are hiding their feelings because of me, because they know that I'm very, very concerned about the people back there. When you say that, you mean your family? Yes. I know it's difficult for them. It's very difficult because a home is a home mm. and a hotel is a hotel. Uh, we are getting everything. There is food, there is rooms, there is internet, but definitely if it's home, all the time we say it's home sweet home. So home is always sweet, but they haven't been saying anything about that because whenever they, how I understand that uh, they are concerned is whenever say, they say, they say, oh, we are blessed that you are alive. So that is what on that time I analyzed that they must be missing home. They must be missing their home. They must be missing home here. Do you think you can build a life in the UK? Of course I can, because I believe in humanity. And the reason that today uh, I'm here is uh, basically the human belief that I have. And that is why I again stress on humanity, on connection, on relation, on confidence, because it's nothing else but the high value of those friends who really believed and worked with me as a human. Mm. I did not ask them, really. They asked me at the beginning, Hasina, how are you? Hasina, are you fine? Hasina, are you okay? Hasina, good morning, how are you? Did you eat, did you? So there is no policy or anything in here. It's just a real connection of humanity. I'm very confident that I can do that. Do you think you will ever be able to go back again and, yes. and live in Afghanistan? Yes. You do? Yes, because I'm a, a, my, I'm a very hopeful person. I'm a very positive person. I will have challenges. We will have challenges. But I know that struggle brings result. And I will struggle to bring the result. So that is why I am hopeful. But I need to struggle double and triple to really get to those who need me. Hasina Safi, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you very much. And thank you to you for being with us and listening to that remarkable conversation. Until we meet again, do take care and goodbye.